So, welcome back to uh, chapter eight, then, uh, popular culture in Britain since 1945. And uh, uh, I was looking at some of the other um, theories of um, uh, about uh, popular culture and about cultural studies, which uh, existed uh, after having a look at, at, at Adorno. And these, uh, these um, uh, theories uh, attempt to explain different aspects of popular culture. Uh, sometimes they contradict uh, Adorno on the point of view of reception, and they say that rather than uh, the consumer having an empty head, which the media fills up with whatever the media chooses to 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 fill it up with, uh, rather the uh, consumer, the listener, the viewer uh, is more active uh, and uh, takes the material. Uh, of the cultural product which has been given out and uh, uses some of it and uh, 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 appreciates other parts of it for particular, as they say, uses and gratifications, the, the uses and gratifications theory, which uh, underlines how selective the consumer is uh, and also emphasizes that uh, uh, the um, con consumer, that is us, ordinary people who consume popular culture, which we all do almost every day, uh, are not passive, but are actually agents in here that we are uh, making and remaking our uh, the symbolic landscape in our heads uh, using um, the um, the what is available to us. So although um, the content of uh, culture available to us may limit our capacity to move in certain directions, uh, it certainly does not dictate what is in our head. Uh, and uh, as one um, theorist uh, uh, mentioned, there are three possible ways uh, of taking uh, of uh, adapting to the content you're receiving, you can interpret it in the way that the producer wanted it. That you know, you can go along with uh, with a, a a film which is uh, uh, has a particular uh, view. You can take it in and say, oh yes, uh, it can push you in the same direction, um, or uh, you can uh, interpret it in a, in an opposition in an oppositional manner. Uh, in, a, in an oppositional manner, we'll look at a little bit more at that later. But I, I'd got as far as Richard Hoggart and the uses of literacy, which had uh, some elements of a um, a manifesto in it, really, about how uh, culture needs to be looked at and what needs to be done, uh, because he does suggest there's a certain danger. Uh, so Hoggart regrets what he sees as the breakup of the old class culture, in particular, the working class culture, and lamenting the loss of the close-knit communities and the replacement, the replacement of their culture by the emerging manufactured mass culture. Now, uh, this must not be seen as fact, but as a particular view to be uh, evaluated. The close-knit communities certainly existed to some extent uh, when in the 1930s, in the 1940s, uh, uh, working class boys would work uh, in the same factory as their, their parents, their fathers had, and working class girls uh, might well follow a similar uh, uh, pattern to what their mothers have done. Uh, when you got married or you were looking for a house a couple of hundred yards from your parents' house uh, to, stay, to stay close, um, whereas of course, uh, 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 in the year 2000 and the year 2020, uh, this is something which happens in a completely uh, different manner. Uh, people often don't know their neighbours very closely. Uh, they're not in and out of their houses all the time, uh, as, you, as, as used to be the case. So it's certain, it's obviously true that something has changed. Now, is this a loss and a decline or a change uh, which uh, has been compensated in other ways. This, of course, is a matter of opinion and analysis. But for Richard Hoggart, there was something of a decline involved. Uh, and key features of this for him are the tabloid newspapers, uh, actually invented in the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, uh, advertising and the triumph of Hollywood. So this is, a, uh, if you like, a, a discourse we've become used to among, uh, certainly among intellectuals, that you know that there's something uh, about Hollywood's culture or American culture, uh, which is uh, uh, in some way taking away real local culture. And you see these ideas again and again. Uh, you see them in popular music with people saying, oh yes, it's important to go and see the concerts of the small local bands. Uh, and we're not so keen on the enormous world phenomena uh, which other bands might have. Uh, uh, and uh, for uh, Richard Hoggart, he's, he's, he's frightened of there being a uniformization of culture, that the alien phenomena 
uh, like Hollywood, uh, like uh, uh, rock and roll, if you like, uh, and so and and, and like you know, international uh, musical culture, have colonized local communities and robbed them of their distinctive features. Again, of course, what is important is not uh, whether you agree, but uh, that you can understand where he is coming from. So what did he do? Well, he founded the Center for Cultural Studies uh, in, in, in Birmingham. So he wanted to make sure that it, it, these things were studied. Uh, and he also had a particular opinion about how you should look at art, how you should look at creative products, whether it's music, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, novels, whether it's um, uh, cinema. Uh, he felt that what, uh, what uh, you should do when you're reading art is you need to look for the felt quality of life uh, in a society. The art, art should, uh, when it's good, capture the experience of the everyday as unique. Um, that is to say, it should be able to articulate those things which people weren't necessarily talking about, but people were taking for granted. Now, these are difficult uh, idea, ideas to grasp, but you, you can um, perhaps compare them uh, or see how they apply to the last few films you saw. Uh, the uh, second uh, great, uh, the second grandfather uh, of cultural studies I want to mention is Raymond Williams. Now, uh, Raymond Williams was a Marxist. Uh, uh, of course, there are very many varieties of Marxist, uh, but fundamentally, um, the Marxist says you need to begin, if you're analyzing culture, you need to begin with the production and reproduction of everyday life. Uh, what do people spend their days, do their days doing? How do they make their living? Who pays for their food? Uh, start with the material and then build up from there. And so uh, when you're looking at uh, uh, popular music, you'd be, you'd be interested in this case, which social classes listen to it. Uh, what? Do, why do they like it? What do they get out of it? Uh, and so on and so forth. And here are a series of book of the books which he he put which he he wrote. Uh, some of the quite difficult culture and society, 1780 to 1950. So a long period there. Uh, quite often uh, historians are specialists of more uh, more reduced periods. So they, they, they go in the country and the city. Uh, he looked at the different meanings of the country to people. Uh, uh, and you, for example, it's it's well known that the meaning of the countryside to somebody who lives in a big city like London is quite different from the meaning of the countryside to somebody who lives in a, in a small um, town where the countryside is only 10 minutes walk away. And indeed, it sometimes seems to me that people who live in the countryside never go there, but that's my own personal opinion. So uh, he wanted to look at, you know, what does the countryside mean to people? That is to say, not just a history of the things which have happened in the countryside, the different forms of property relation, the different forms of agriculture and work that go on there, but actually what it meant to people in their heads, how did they see uh, city life? And of course, uh, uh, city life, which uh, at one point, perhaps 100 years ago, was seen as a tremendous move forward that people were uh, so very often so expressed how much delight they were to be uh, in a place where you didn't see the same 200 people month after month after month, where everything could be surprising and where the uh, variety of uh, uh, cultural experience on offer was enormous. Uh, or, uh, whereas today, and perhaps for the last 20 or 30 years, uh, you have had a revalorization of the countryside where uh, it becomes a value in itself. Uh, and uh, endless pop songs talk about getting out of the city and finding more happiness in the countryside. So all these things uh, Raymond William was uh, interested in. Uh, also the, the association of culture and reading and criticism. Uh, one of the ideas that uh, Raymond William came up with is that there are different forms of culture. There is a uh, dominant culture, there is um, uh, the, 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 uh, the culture of the, of the of future society and the culture of past society. Uh, so the, the dominant culture at the moment might be, uh, for example, ro uh, romance is still part of the dominant, dominant culture and uh, um, uh, entrepreneurialism. If you work hard individually and you have uh, uh, creative original ideas, you'll make it. Um, and that would be dominant uh, ideology or dominant culture. Um, residual culture from the society of the past might be something like the monarchy, all the interest there is for, uh, for the, uh, the royal family in Britain and so on 
today doesn't appear to fit with society because this idea that you're superior because of your blood is generally rejected these days, uh, in my opinion, for, fortunately. So you might uh, uh, identify uh, monarchism, not just as a political ideology, but as an emotional um, game, if you like. You might identify this as residual culture. It was created a long time ago, but it just didn't go away when it was no longer necessary for the core activities of society. Uh, and finally, he speaks of, um, I can't remember the actual word he uses, but the culture of the future uh, that is coming up. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of uh, Raymond Williams, who, uh, uh, as, uh, as he is a Marxist, he believes that capitalism is temporary uh, and therefore forms of culture, for example, perhaps uh, workers' cooperatives um, or um, free uh, exchange of goods, uh, might be considered to be the culture of a future uh, society, that they're, they're the beginnings, the seeds of some future society, that they're not based on uh, capitalist values. And although in this society they're bound to be minority uh, in, uh, interests, they, they can be seen as having some sort of a, a future um, uh, meaning. So here we have, a, 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 oh, and there we have the words, which is wonderful. Um, so culture for Williams is an expression of the coherence of organic communities. So these are class communities or the black community or whatever. Uh, and they are resisting determinism in the sense that they are not simply accepting their position in society. Um, and uh, for uh, Williams, I think I already mentioned this, culture is uh, both is material, intellectual and, spirit, and spiritual, all of these things. Uh, he is very interested in texts. Uh, te a text might be uh, a novel or a film or a documentary or a, a song, a little text uh, in uh, cultural studies speak. Uh, he is very interested in texts which capture the structure of feeling of everyday life, this is his, his words, the sense of an epoch, yeah? How did it feel? Uh, you had to be there or you couldn't understand it, you know, whether it's the, uh, whether it's 1968 or, uh, or 2020. Uh, I'm sure that in a very few years time, we'll be saying to people uh, 10 years younger than us or 20 years younger than us, uh, you had to be there. You can't imagine what 2020 was like. You had to be there and, uh, and, and, uh, Let's hope there will be uh, good novels and films talking about uh, what was going on, not just from a factual point of view, but from a point of view of the structure of feeling. And Raymond Williams, then we get the vocabulary at the end, dominant, residual and emergent ideologies and cultural forms. I've explained these just uh, a moment ago. Now, within the uh, Birmingham School, you've got a large number of uh, interpretations and, uh, and analyses of uh, different uh, kinds of uh, culture, uh, but uh, Dick Hebdiger was one of the uh, very influential um, authors who wrote this book uh, in the, I think it's in the 70s, uh, I might get a date if, I, if I'm lucky, maybe not, um, uh, Subculture, the Meaning of Style. Uh, th so this at this point was still uh, uh, rather original. Uh, so first of all, he underlines, as Margaret Mac Mead did, that a culture does not to be, need to be the culture of the entire national society, that it can be of a subgroup. And in a period where mods and rockers and then later punks and metalheads and reggae people were emerging as this new phenomenon in a way, because uh, uh, I think the uh, large subculture uh, based on music and clothes uh, was unknown before uh, the Second World War, mostly because people could not afford to buy m more than the basic minimum uh, 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 of clothes. And so he had a look at it and he wanted to know what does it mean? What does, it, what does style mean? What does it represent socially, culturally, psychologically? Whereas, whereas of course, at this time, uh, still a lot of university, uh, a lot of intellectuals or commentators in newspapers uh, 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 etc. It doesn't mean anything. It's just silly things that young people do. Uh, and so he wanted to look at them in some detail. Uh, and uh, his book, Subculture, The Meaning of Style, uh, consists of two parts and nine chapters. Uh, and he tries to uh, take individually uh, then uh, different uh, um, subcultures often based on popular music, although they can be based on other thing, you know, skateboard culture will come later, surfing culture, not in Britain, but elsewhere. 
And so he looks at a few of them. For, the, for example, Ho uh, Holiday in the Sun, that's a, the, a song of the uh, Sex Pistols. Um, Mr. Rotten makes the grade. This is the question of you know, what does punk mean? What are these symbols? The safety pin. What is a safety pin? Is it some sort of return to uh, babyhood, return to childhood, a re rejection of the idea that you, you must grow up and be sensible and reasonable and moderate and, uh, um, and, and harmonious. Uh, it, it's fairly clear that the uh, uh, rising level of discipline in people's lives uh, with uh, longer obligatory schooling uh, and uh, form, uh, uh, life at work uh, in bigger companies being far more bureaucratically organized in the 70s and 80s rather than in the 20s and 30s, uh, it is perhaps not surprising that some elements of rebellion such as punk could find uh, a large uh, uh, number of uh, followers among uh, school children and among uh, office workers and so on. He goes on to look at ra the Rastafarian solution, uh, the reggae and the Rastafarian solution. Uh, so uh, reggae is music, of course, but also as a whole series of ideas, first of all, around uh, uh, rebellion against the system, but a, a rebellion which is mostly about feeling good and jamming with your friends, not so much about fighting as such. Um, uh, and of course, Rastafarianism then, uh, and very much the, the, the back to Africa idea, then this uh, um, spiritual uh, quest to, be, to go back to Africa uh, if you're a black American. And uh, uh, he looks at how reggae became very popular among other groups who were not black and who were not going back to Africa. And he looks at why, what did it do for them? Why did they like it? Uh, uh, and all of this is, the, is based on the whole premise of cultural studies and indeed what Pierre Bourdieu was saying and so on, that if you like this kind of music, of course, you tend to say, well, I like it because I like it. Uh, and that is absolutely insufficient uh, uh, as, as, an, as, a, as an explanation. The things we like feel personal, but are social. Uh, continuing then Beats and Teddy Boys, this is uh, uh, some years after the the mods and the teddy boys became in the early 60s the first uh, uh, groups of uh, uh, young people influenced by subculture to fight against each other and uh, very very strong emotional um, uh, involvement and even today you know it's it's not that difficult to find people not just who don't listen to reggae or don't listen to punk or don't listen to rap or don't listen to country music but who say i hate it uh, and that's absolutely fascinating because, of course, studying what people like is interesting, but studying what people hate when it doesn't really uh, uh, threaten them in any way. Because, you know, if people listen to country music um, or uh, opera or whatever, um, it's not actually a threat to us, but it's very common for people to hate certain, certain sorts of music. And that is uh, fascinating because it means uh, that popular culture has a power and has an influence on our lives and has a meaning in our lives, which is worth uh, studying. Uh, in the second part of uh, Hebdiger's book, uh, Subculture and the Meaning mean of Style, then he goes into some of the details. First of all, uh, what it means for people. And secondly, what it means to the corporations, because it's become a very classic narrative of popular culture that some movements, the word is used very, very vaguely in popular culture, begins by being rebellious and late, later becomes incorporated. Uh, and I, I will have a, a, an, a, 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 an, an example for you. In fact, I, might, I may even be able to find this, uh, this example now if I'm, uh, uh, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm smart about this. Uh, but I'm sure you remember uh, that punk was a tremendously um, rebellious um, uh, cultural form. Uh, that, that's to say, not necessarily that it helped organize uh, any uh, practical rebellions, but that the whole idea of being a punk was being against, was uh, uh, rejecting, and indeed uh, some of the uh, slogans and, uh, and mantras that uh, came out of this were thing, things like uh, no future, there's no future, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and op opposing uh, respectability and, uh, and the Queen and, uh, 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 and, 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 and so on. I wonder if this is really going to work. I'm afraid not. I think I'll show it you in class uh, 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 instead. 
Uh, right, so what else do we have here? Yes, okay, number eight, yes, there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Stylus homology. Uh, now, homology me, is the idea uh, that it, it go it it, it has uh, that it, it's linked on a horizontal level. That is to say, uh, you might uh, uh, in certain countries at certain times you could say, oh yes, well, all working class people liked this, uh, and only middle class people like this. The idea of, of, homolo of homology they actually match one to one, uh, and he looks at this and sees uh, you know how much it, it can be. Uh, put together uh, and then he looks again at cult subculture and art is subculture art is punk music or punk uh, painting uh, or street art or different forms of popular culture is it art now this is very interesting from the uh, point of view of the producers because certainly uh, the uh, crooners of the 1940s or the rock and rollers of the 1950s or the punks of the 1970s generally did not have the habit of saying we are artists certainly the crooners of the 19 of the 1940s they felt that they were entertainers and the rock and rollers well they, they felt that they were you know art was some somewhere up there and that wasn't interesting to them but with the uh, rise of higher education and the more generalized uh, idea of what art is you find that today um uh, rappers for example very frequently speak about their art and use the word art and and, and so this again uh, is uh, tremendously in, uh, important because it shows what's uh, how how do people see their own uh, cultural practice and so here we he see then some of the examples yes uh, that you get the skinhead look uh, from a particular period of course it changes from a particular period the the, the skinhead look with the the braces um and uh and of course the 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 the, the particular uh, uh, ha uh hairstyle and then some of the uh, some of the punk styles uh, uh now uh most of these subcultures uh being in some way oppositional uh they will be moving against whatever the most dominant ideology is and that the ideology at this time for the man you know so you know dress yourself in in a suit perhaps even a suit and tie. I don't mean that necessarily the, uh, the majority of the population had one, but this was the, the, the sort of value that the, the newsreader had a suit and tie, uh, the, uh, the headmaster had a suit and tie, and this was the value, valorized one. Uh, and so obviously wearing torn clothes uh, was a, a rebellion both against that dominant and also against the respectable working class uh, idea of you know always being well turned out that or e even sometimes even better turned out than the higher classes because if you come from a poor family or from a working class family you might want to show very visibly uh, how valuable you are where some aristocrat can just hang around in jeans uh, it doesn't matter so much okay so there's obviously a re rebellious side to the uh, to the to the clothes style but also there are some rather uh, and you get similar things later on with the baggy I mean the baggy uh, is obviously um, a uh, very visible and therefore a loud uh, protestation against the elegant uh, the elegant and uh, and uh, and bourgeois uh, and and elite and and, and hip and hip um, although it becomes hip in a different way um, uh, and then uh, and then again there could be particular ideas and what is this this piercing and the, what, what is this piercing um, stuff uh, is it partly uh, a form of uh, symbolic self-harm yeah that the idea is you know we've all again the dominant ideology we will almost be clean and uh, and well put together and uh, and, uh, and and straight straight along the line and so if you can do things which are do not fit that then that can have a subcultural value now one of the things that later writers have pointed out about subcultures because uh, 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 dick hebdiger and some other groups as well and there's a wonderful thesis by tim heron about uh, punk in northern ireland um, but very often the people who've studied it they would concentrate on the hardcore punks or the hardcore reggae that, that is that the people whose entire lives turned around punk music is that what's the most important thing about me i'm a punk um, however later authors have emphasized that there were probably more weekend punks than full-time punks and the same goes for hippies or uh, metalheads or uh, rappers or uh, bangra people or um, whatever 
Now, uh, in my classes, I'm going to concentrate mostly on the subcultures from the 60s to the 90s, because there's something of a uh, classic period involved there. And I think that many of the later um, uh, currents can be analyzed with the same tools. Also, of course, being old, I know less about the uh, later uh, ones. So you get the, uh, the, uh, um, the motor, uh, the bikers, um, subculture, the bikers uh, uh, presentation. I think that's probably American actually with the Southern Cross uh, and then underneath the, uh, the reggae. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, of course, the meanings of these music, the cultural meanings, the socio-psychological meanings uh, of any given uh, cultural current is not fixed. And one of the mo most famous examples is that the early skinheads uh, in Britain Elsewhere, probably too, but I know about Britain. The early skinheads in Britain loved black music, uh, black reggae music. That was very much part of their and ska. That was very much part of their uh, of, uh, of, the, of their culture. Uh, and it was some time later uh, that there became a, a quite a sizable current within skinhead culture of white power, white superiority, and racism. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, unsurprising because cultural uh, products and cultural currents can be taken and reworked and put out uh, uh, in another way uh, with uh, another meaning. Now, uh, uh, this is indeed one of the later, one of the later writings inside subculture, the postmodern meaning of style. And this uh, uh, writer, this is David, David Muggleton, uh, he complained that Hebdiger had a couple of major faults. First of all, he tended to uh, mostly talk about full time punks and full time hitters and full time teddy boys. Uh, but secondly, he, he claimed, uh, Muggleton claims, that Hebdiger's view was too much from the outside. And I just want to finish this section on subculture, and I'm going to be moving on to something completely different next time, uh, with a question about men and women, because uh, uh, it seems uh, fairly clear, or it seems clear to me anyway, that reggae subculture and punk subculture and metal subculture, just to take those, um, uh, deal very much with what does it mean to be a man? What is masculinity? Um, and indeed rock and roll also. So what were the women doing at the time? And now it, it, it's uh, uh, sad to say there was little room in the subcultures for women for a long time, certainly in uh, rock and roll. Uh, and indeed, even in, in, in within popular music in general, there was a, a tremendous uh, male, male domination. Um, Interestingly enough, the first uh, uh, subcultures in the British context, which left quite a big space for women, or I should say, which women came in and took quite a big space for, would be punk. Uh, that is, the, the, there were a series. Of course, the place of punk, the place of women within punk, was a minority position, but there was a real space there, and there was a number of very popular uh, female punk groups like the Raincoats, like the Slits. Uh, and indeed, one of the uh, one of the pop punk uh, idols was uh, polystyrene from X-ray Spectre, uh, um, a non-white woman. Uh, so it, it, it could happen. And, and indeed, in rap, as we will be seeing, there have been uh, major influential women rappers in Britain um, uh, from the beginning, even. Uh, however, it's fair to say that the space for women was small, and it was some time later in the 1990s, not in the 1970s, that you began to get currents which were actually built around uh, the idea of femininity. What is it to be a, a to be a woman, to be a girl? Uh, and the and the first one would be well, the, the most well known one from the 90s <coughs> would be the Riot Girls, and you see how they spell it, grr. Uh, which is fascinating and has all the classic um, characteristics of a subculture, very, very high level of individual identification. This is really, who am I? I am, I am a riot, what riot girl. Not just I listen to this music, but I am, and I dress like it, and I am, and I, I want people to know it. And, and the fans, here you have a fanzine. You know, the fanzines uh, uh, mostly rose with punk, but then continued. This is this amateur, often local magazine, very cheap a grassroots uh, form uh, of, uh, 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 of publishing, uh, which again is a sign of people of the higher level of education of the, uh, of the population in, uh, in, in general. Uh, and uh, that just reminds me of a study uh, of uh, uh, rap music in France. They studied rap music in France and contrary to the uh, 
uh, the complaints of old men who don't like rap, uh, they found that the vocabulary of, of, of rap, uh, rappers was very often extremely extended with a very, very wide vocabulary, because vocabulary isn't everything, but it, it just shows that the, the higher level of education has really uh, made its mark on, 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 on popular culture. So to come back to women then, so then you get this, this current looking at femininity. And I, again, I don't think there are so many. It'd be interesting to see if later uh, subcultures um, uh, have a more uh, a more balanced uh, male female um, balance. Uh, and the final question about subcultures is: Are they still possible in the same way in the internet age? Uh, up until the 1990s, you are building your subculture locally around the people you know and the and the uh, and the concerts you go to and the fanzines and so on. But can you have this kind of uh, partly uh, confidential? Uh, not secretive, but uh, um, what's the word? Uh, local and uh, and vibrant culture. Can you have this with the internet? Now you have your Facebook group, and you can have your five thousand members who like a particular kind of hardcore death metal, uh, and they might be all over the world. And so, is that is that hap is that going to be a subculture in the same way? And obviously not. But is it still a subculture in some other way? Uh, can indeed can the underground still exist uh, when? Uh, you can find anything uh, that it's no longer. Uh, they used to say that, you know, if you want to see uh, the real heavy metal, you have to know where to go. And that's obviously no longer the case. You just need to be able to type into Google. So what did that do to subculture? So all of this is not really a history lesson about a particular period of British history. Uh, it's a reflection or an exploration of what do cultural products mean to people? What, what part of themselves do they put in them and why? Uh, and how does this fit, fit into uh, society, society in general and, and for us, uh, British society? That was the end of chapter eight. Uh, there will be more.